As Malcolm X once said, the Zionist argument to justify Israel's present occupation of Arab Palestine has no intelligent basis in history. Nelson Mandela would even say, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedoms of the Palestinians. And finally, the great thinker Albert Einstein would say, it would be my greatest sadness to see Zionists do to the Palestinian Arabs much of what Nazis did to the Jews. The year is 2021, and there is still no peace in the Middle East. Kissinger, where are you at? In the region previously known as Palestine, the Holy Land, the state of Israel continues to oppress the Palestinians with its Zionistic tendencies. But let's take a step back and get lost in how this all began. Hey, I'm lo- <coughs> Hey, I'm- Lost? This video was supposed to be about the politicization of the youth of the 21st century, with the backdrop of Jojo Rabbit. But things have changed. Into my research in fanaticism and youth, I ran into Zionism and the Polish youth movement in the interwar period. Thus, this video of the Polish youth will be my part one uh, and serve as an introduction to that video. Here, I'll take you on a journey into a far right wing group that is often overlooked, the revisionist Zionist movement. This is a gut-wrenching tale of indoctrination, violence, and terror of a man named Jabotinsky and his obedient children. take a dive, there are some important distinctions that must be made. First, one can be anti-Israel and anti-Zionist and not be an anti-Semite. The state of Israel has crossed many human rights violations, such as the blockade that prevents aid and healthcare to Palestinians in Gaza. Secondly, Zionism is an ideology that seeks to cement a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, there must be distinctions made here as the initial form of Zionism to build a state side by side the Palestinians was an ambitious and one that was true to the nature of the cause. The version of Zionism that exists today and that is led by Benjamin Netanyahu is one of the revisionist Zionists created by Vladimir Jabotinsky in the 1920s to the 1940s. This form of Zionism is one that wishes to create a Jewish state in Palestine that is purely Jewish, thus ridding any Arab presence. This is an extreme form that is also protested by common Jews around the world as it gives them a bad look. Finally, Jews are not creating a plot to take over the world as they live among us like normal folks. It is the Zionists in Israel who are colonizing a land where Arabs, Christians, and Jews had lived in 
for hundreds of years in peace, living as neighbors. Although I say the Jews in Israel, that is referring to the government and those who elected them to power. Not all Jews who live in Palestine or Israel desire harm on the Arabs and the Palestinians. Distinction number two, the different faces of fascism. To begin, fascism was born in Italy in the First World War by a man named Benito Mussolini. Thought liberal democracies were weak and a strong man was needed to lead a nation. He also had a disdain for communism in his country, as Italy was swinging far left after the war had ravaged the nation. The first phase of fascism was Italian. It took aim at unifying the nation through intimidation and got rid of the communists in a snap. Mussolini brought in elements of the great Roman past and stated he would bring it back to the greatness with a modern touch. Once this initial face was seen by the world as an effective method of fighting communism, it would be mimicked. A lot of people, including the Americans, would celebrate the rise of Mussolini and the direction of Italy. A long fan of Mussolini was Adolf Hitler, who would make the racial element a cornerstone to his fascism. Unlike Mussolini, who in the shadows eliminated those who were not suited for his ideal nation, Hitler would use fear and pull on the anxieties of the Germans in his version of fascism. Hitler and Mussolini were the fascists of old. The modern fascists mask their fascism and master the technique of ambiguity. One of the first of these kinds of fascists was Jabotinsky, who would mend fascism into the Zionist ideology, emerging a new face of fascism. Jabotinsky would be one of many who would mend and mold fascism as many other nations tried to make fascism suit their nation and their ideology. Although Jabotinsky succeeded because he was a deep admirer of his hero Mussolini, but also the Jewish youth were putting on Mussolini's fascism as if it was fashion. But to truly understand Jabotinsky, revisionist movement, we must first peer into the monster that was Mussolini. After the end of the First World War, the world was not the communist Soviet revolution had rattled the entire world. The traditional was being challenged by the youth, especially the women who were demanding for their rights to vote and to be citizens. Many men, like the men who live in our world today, saw the role of masculinity was being attacked and common leftist ideas were seen as gateways to communism. Thus, Mussolini and his thugs would not allow it. Violence 
became a staple. A staple for fascism. Thus, Mussolini romanticized the strong military man once more, even after a bloody war where millions of young men had been used as pawns in a slaughter. But Mussolini was seen as a man amongst men and was admired by the youths for his acts and words. Like Jabotinsky, he was a journalist who could incite violence at will. The fascists at first were seen as a gang of thugs. They were not considered a threat because their ideology were filled with straw men. But Mussolini was a monster. He would use intimidation, violence, and assassinations to seize power and then march to Rome, brutally pushing anyone who came into his path. He stood for masculinity, for traditional values, law and order, and wished to eradicate any sign of communism in Italy. The communists, the anarchists, the dissenters, the rebels, the protester, the critic were all seen and framed as those that must be exterminated first. To the viewer who saw Mussolini as a hero, they tended to look away from the negative aspects of his regime. Jabotinsky and the Polish youth thought Mussolini was on their side and that the Italian Jews were being assimilated into his nation as unity was strength. Yet, they solemnly ignored or cheered Mussolini's attempt to cleanse Italy of communists, of socialists, of disabled people and homosexuals and those who were not seen to be desirable. In truth, Mussolini was deeply racist to African people as the Ethiopians in the First World War handed Italy a humiliating loss and thus they were his first targets. The fascists of Italy used people and once they were deemed unworthy to the nation they were disposed of. Many say that Mussolini's fascism was corporate and militaristic and he did not dabble into race as his buddy Hitler did. And that's how his fascism differed. But once Hitler's fascist propaganda justified the extermination of the Jewish people, he followed and took action as the removal of diseased elements from the body to defend its overall health was the reasoning. Once Hitler's fascism deemed the Jewish people as undesirables, Mussolini would follow and justify it in his regime. Jabotinsky's revisionist Zionism was birth when he fought in the First World War. He was there, in Palestine, helping the British take it over. The myth, the legend, would be born there. But in truth, he did not help take Jerusalem, but was stationed as a guard <laughs> and when he got furious and surveyed his superiors attacking the Arabs, he would be sentenced to hard labor. The legend, the hero who fought for his nation, 
is just a myth. A lie. After the end of the Treaty of Versailles, when both the Arabs and the Jews failed to convince Britain to basically have claim over the land, the Mandate of Palestine, the Mandate of Iraq, of Syria, was placed in. And thus, Jabotinsky went home humiliated and at loss. And thus, in this feeling of almost gaining what he dreamt of, revisionism was created. As a journalist, Jabo began to write of revisionist Zionism to awaken the youth in order to have them fight. Revisionist Zionism was turned away by the intellectual community though. His articles in Britain, France, Germany, in America all failed to rile up the youth. And thus the youth that Jabotinsky desired could not be found. They were the youth many historians allude to after the war. The lost generation who joined the ranks of socialists and fought against traditionalism. The youth of that generation identified as those who questioned the world and the traditions of society as they despised the military and the destruction it brought. These were not the youth Jabotinsky wanted, as they questioned him and his militaristic points to create a Jewish legion in Palestine to fight the Arabs. Jabo wanted youth who could listen to his command, who would die willingly for Zionism, for Israel. After years of trying and failing and quitting down in his luck and almost hitting the levels of poverty, Jabotinsky would strike gold and he would discover the Polish Jewish youth who had been eating his words and he had become a rock star in Poland. And thus he was pulled by them to Poland. But... Jabotinsky was in deep discontent as he thought that they were too simple-minded and not intellectual, uh, not at his intellectual level for the initial type of youth he thought revisionist Zionism would click with. Before we take a look at Jabotinsky's little fascists, Let's first set the stage of Poland after the end of the First World War. Poland, once a proud nation that was conquered by, by the Tsarist Russian Empire. It is a nation that was brought back after the end of the First World War as the Soviet Union signed off a huge chunk of its empire to Germany in order to end the war. Thus, in 1981, it was considered to be a young democracy and an unstable one, as presidents would get assassinated by the far right. They desired an Enjenka, which called for eliminating Jews and communists by the Catholic Poles. Such a, such a wonderful and brilliant <laughs> idea. <laughs> oh man. The man who would tame Poland was Joseph Pilsidiski. 
who took power in 1926 to 1939. He plays a key factor in the story as his son Janka, or the healing. A movement made to keep both the far right and the far left at bay. Now, the Polish Jews were somewhat tolerated as citizens. As Pil Sadusky believed, a citizen was one who showed their loyalty to the nation and was not based off ethnicity. The Zionists used this to assimilate as they would join marches and parades, showing their nationalism and love for Poland. The revisionist youth would use it to justify their war against communism and socialists. But not any communists and socialists, the leftist side of the Zionist movement. That's right. Zionism also had communists. <laughs> In his years, the revisionist movement would thrive. Jabotinsky was a master of ambiguity and contradictions, which allowed the far right of the Zionist movement to flirt with fascism as he dodged. While Zionism rose in Europe, there were never direct calls for a violent takeover of the Holy Land. Jabotinsky would change this and let his youth speak for him. The revisionist aim was always to take back Palestine from the Arabs and dominate them with might. It is noted by Daniel Heller that Jabotinsky may flirt with fascist ideas, but there were key factors that dragged him further right. One of these was that the labor Zionists in Palestine were having successes. This outraged Jabotinsky and he would swiftly wage war on the leftist Jews. He would incite violence on both Arabs and leftist Jews in Palestine. Jabotinsky would almost mimic his hero Mussolini's words, as both the Arabs and the labor Zionists in Palestine were diseases that must be purged. A need for a harsh cure, he would say cold words. Yet, unlike Mussolini, Jabotinsky was very hesitant as he treaded thin ice. Unlike his followers and others in the right-wing Zionist sphere at the time. Here are some notable quotes. Heller would write, Jabotinsky increasingly paid heed to his younger followers when they presented him with fascism. Good ideas. Among these followers was Chaim Vardy, a Polish Jew studying in the University of Rome. Jabotinsky would claim that Vardy, an admirer of Italian fascism, taught him the value of describing Jews as a race in order to mobilize support. See, the concept of race was ambiguous. A quote that I'll show you and emphasize more on later, but here I want to focus on the element of purification and how Nazis, uh, I mean uh, fascists in general, are very obsessed with purifying the nation. Here's a quote about a they basically transform Hanukkah into a purification call. And then the battle ended, when all the nation could freely breathe and the temple was cleaned. They lit the menorah with their iron spears, spears purified by blood. Only once they had expelled the enemy with these spears and battled for freedom they could light the menorah in the holy temple. The revisionist Zionists would also adopt 
the racial question from the far right, signaling the Arabs as an inferior race that long corrupted the Holy Lands. However, the Arab question was turned around and made ambiguous as they framed it as the Arab threat. Thus, the revisionist Zionists must be trained and became militarized, ever ready to go to Palestine to fight the enemy. Every fascist state recalls a glorious past. Jabotinsky would do the same by recalling the days of King David and the great Jewish Empire that had long been eroded by the Romans, the Persians, and the Arabs. It was an empire that must be restored and purified. Now let's put this justification into perspective. My ancestors descend from the Caucasus mountain region. The Circassians were simple folk who loved to dance and farm. They were nicknamed the people of the mountains, the Yarkasas. In 1763, the invasion began. Russia, under Tsar Nicholas I, <laughs> began building his forts on the Cir on Circassian soil. The Circassian War would last 101 years. By the end of it, the Circassian Genocide began. The Ottoman Empire chimed in and took in the exiled Muslims into their lands. One of those many families who traveled across the mountains was my own family who migrated to Syria. Like Jabotinsky, the Russians' aims in Circassia were to eliminate any hostiles in the area, no matter the cost. Atrocities were committed throughout the region. One method soldiers would entertain themselves by was tearing the bellies of pregnant women and removing the baby inside. As much as this history boils my blood, it would make little sense for me to return to where my ancestors lived and wage war against the Russians. But that's exactly what Jabotinsky did, using ancient history and myths to rile the youth and fight against his enemies. History can be the ultimate propaganda. To rile, to inspire the youth further, Jabotinsky would make use of his dead comrade, Trumpeldor, and make him into a Zionist icon of what the ideal soldier who fought for Israel and killed Arabs should look like. Trumpeldor, the ideal soldier, died for his nation. And thus, the youth would look up to him and not just want to work, but also in offering blood, real blood. Some Berter, move, some Berter leaders frequently used Trumpledore's death as the framing device for their glorifications of blood, battle, and sacrifice. As Jabotinsky's comrade in the First World War apparently died saying these last words. It is good to die for one's country. Actually, wait, one second, sorry, sorry. It was more like this. It is good to die for our country. 
Those were the words. Those were... <laughs> Those were the alleged words that Trumpledore said before he died. Trumpledore was used as a hero to recruit the youth into better. As Trump fan boys would emerge. At one point, Jabotinsky would say that the youth loved Trumpledore the soldier, not his hammer, not his shovel, not his plow, but his sword. The core method of Trumpledore's death was that killing one's enemy was a necessity for building a nation. In truth, Trumpledore was what Jabotinsky hated the most. He was a socialist, a man who wanted the Jewish homeland to be built by Jewish workers and hated the idea of a militarized ethos in Zionism. Yet, his death was used to allure and create a militarized ethos that he despised. This myth is past, and this icon of Trumpledore would unleash many young Polish youth to travel to Israel, seeking the joy of sacrificing their lives for the nation. I wish to conclude this chapter by saying that Jabotinsky using his comrade's death is absolutely disgusting. Trumpledore, may you rest in peace and your vision for Palestine did not come to be. In his video, Kill the Kill, Fashion, Fascism, and the Fight for Freedom, Michael Saba decodes how fascism uses fashion to create hierarchies. However, one thing I just now understood from this video was that in, in the 1920s to the 1930s, fascism was in fashion. The Polish Zionist youth in the 1920s were leaning to the right and were very fashy. But they were the kind who joined the movement because it was in fashion. Heller would explain this in his book, that it was not the ideology of Zionism nor fascism that allured the youth. In truth, many joined Beter to assimilate into Polish society. Instead, Beter, the far-right Zionist wing, acted as a clubhouse where friends would meet. Others joined to wear a uniform and joined the thrill of marching in unison. They would do this by gaining the respect as anti-Semitism always loomed in the background. Some Beter members saw a difference. By performing the roles of a soldier, he noted Jewish youth somehow appeared to be just like Poles. Among the various description of non-Jewish observers in his article, he noted a peasant with a horse passes by and looks at a, the line of marchers. Had he not heard them speak, he would have never believed that they were Jews. Yet, there were others who wanted more, who deeply wanted to fight and crudely stated fascist talking points and the need for real deeds. Although the youth weren't in it for the ideology, indoctrination did work. The propaganda of what a true man looked like and act like did work as the youth became militarized. The youth kept shifting further and further to the right, even as Jabotinsky tried to hold the brake. 
effects. But the consequence of it all was that these youths deeply longed for action. Deeply waiting to fight for Zion, for their national identities. Here are just some quotes of them acting very fashy. A radical group birthed in Palestine at this time was in Insisting that fascist rule and acts of violent radicalism against the British were the only tool which the Jewish state could be established. Others used religious texts and altered them to suit those, the revisionist Zionist cause. Here is props retelling the tale of Menhara's lighting. And then the battle ended when all the nation could freely breathe and the temple was cleaned. They lit the Menhara with their iron spears. Iron spears purified by blood. Only once they had expelled the enemy with their with these spears and battled for freedom they could light the menorah in the holy temple the crusade to purify the nation is still going on to this day however in many instances before the 1930s the youth of Poland calls Jabotinsky to lead them to be their commander and until then, Jabotinsky refused to be the commander of the youth. He wanted to be on the sidelines, spewing out ambiguous lines to rile them up and cater and push youth into his ranks. But in the 1930s, things changed. One aspect of fascism that mesmerized Jabotinsky was the thrill of bodies on the march. Acting in uniform, dressed in uniform, with a uniform ideology and purpose, and all of it organized around a cult of personality of a strong leader. That is what fascism is, and that is exactly what Jabotinsky desired from the youth of Poland. A state in complete uniform probably turned Jabotinsky on. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to include this or not. Like other fascists, Jabotinsky made sure to clamp down on any dissent further press his opponents, the moderate and the left Zionists. One ex-revisionist would recall that the goal of Jabotinsky was not realistic, saying, My schoolmate claimed that Palestine must be liberated, not bought. He said that a Jewish legion must be created and must go to battle. He gave Pilsudiski as an example. I didn't think at the time that the revisionist movement was bad, but the Pilsudiski example seemed ridiculous to me. Pilsudiski, the, the president of Poland at the time, fought on his own territory with the support of 30 million Poles, while barely seven several million non-Poles were in Poland. For every Jew in Palestine, there were three Arabs. I thought the revisionist movement was on a wild goose chase. It was this kind of behavior, this doubt, that was weeded out as proper behavior and a proper script would be instilled in the youth. He would use his little fascists to intimidate his opponents, and if they dare to call him a fascist, brawls would erupt. Yet with such power, Jabotinsky continued to 
describe himself as a democratic leader, even as the Nazis rose and the comparisons began to emerge. Before the 1930s, Jabotinsky was hesitant to take the helm, but as the Zionist organization tried to undo all the work he had done in the 1920s, Jabotinsky would be pushed into a corner, leading to his abandonment of the larger Zionist organization and emerging a dictatorial persona. Thus, the 1930s was a turning point, as it was here where he saw his role not as a journalist who could, from the shadows, guide the youth, but as a commander of a militarized youth. One main reason why he took the helm was to keep the ambiguity he built. What was the motive of revisionist Zionism? Was it to defend Poland or Palestine? However, as the youth began leading far, leaning farther and farther to the right, Jabotinsky was dragged with them. As his hatred for blatant calls of revolts against the British and the lack of room of imagination was pushing things. Thus, Jabotinsky would become the commander with a fear that he would be driven out by the emerging radical Zionist wing in Palestine, the Maximalists. It is here where Jabotinsky would send out spy endorsements for revolutionary violence. As Hitler rose to power, as Jabotinsky gained more and more power, the left continued to compare his revisionist Zionism to the Nazi. Revisionist Zionism wished to eradicate the Arabs and the Socialists, which mirrored Hitler's desire to eradicate the Jew and the Socialists from Germany. On Friday, June 16, 1933, the most powerful labor Zionist leader in the Mandate of Palestine was assassinated. The man who took his life, the man who took the shot was Abraham Stavisky, a Polish immigrant and a member of Bit. What led to this murder were the events of the summer of 1932. When the heat boiled the blood of the revisionist Jews. Clashes between right and left became common. They first began, they first began in Palestine, but soon spread to Poland. It was the heat of these clashes and Jabotinsky playing the role of supreme commander that two of his men would use his ambiguous language to take an adventure or a mission to assassinate the top leader in the Palestinian Zionist Labour Party. Jabotinsky, being quick on his feet, used the clear murder and act of terror to assign the blame on the left. He would claim that it was their responsibility that this happened. By 1933, Jabotinsky was a commander of terrorists, and many people in Poland and in Palestine both recognized that his ambiguous words and his club, Bater, was pushing things to the radical extreme. Jabotinsky would go as far to sabotage Zionist movement to protest against Germany and its anti-Semitism behavior by interrupting the Zionist convention just as the delegates were, delegates were about to issue their declaration. This was the scene. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a scream, 
a whistle. I turn around. I see Jabotins Jab Jabotinsky sitting among his excited gang. He sits as usual with folded hands and somewhat stooped, quietly paying attention to what's happened. I look and I do not understand. Aggregated youth are about to conduct adventures. But how can he, Jabotinsky, sit among them, encircled by them, in the very moment when they were about to make runes out of the little last, little, little last, out of the last little demonstration that we have left against the Nazis? How does he allow these youths, with their whistles and with their wasteful screams, to destroy the historical moment? When, for the first time, the Jewish parliament raises its voice against Hitler. He sits there. He keeps quiet, lightly smiling as the soldiers jump, dance, clap, whistle, beat, tear apart, while the Zionist Congress tries to read its declaration against Hitler. It was a shocking moment. We could, in that very moment, lose any last bit of hope in the maturity of the Jewish people. Although Jabotinsky was untouchable in Eastern Europe, and was held by the youth as his heroic commander, when he toured North America to get away from the heat and reflect, he was reminded of how much of a loser he actually was. He didn't have the magnetic attraction, he would say, as empty auditoriums were filled to see him. In a letter, Jabotinsky would express his two true feelings that things have gone too far, where the stream has reached a point that is so absurd it will cure itself. This quote reminds me of America today, but that's for another time. Jabotinsky has met a crossroads. Go with the stream and join the maximalists who are the radical far-right Zionist group influencing the Polish youth and Jabotinsky's decisions. The maximalists were taking more and more power, and thus to tame them, Jabotinsky saw the only way was to throw away his democratic persona that he had crafted until this point. Or to fight against it. To finally say that things have gone too far, that his hands have been bloodied with the blood of innocence. Jabotinsky would choose the latter. In 1935, the president of Poland, an ally of the Jews, Joseph Pilinski, passed away at the high time of anti-Semitism in Europe. Poland would join Europe as the new president campaigned against the Jews, justifying the Christian Poland fears that were present in the early 1920s. The following year, 1936, the Arab revolts would spark in Palestine, where Arabs would fight both the British and the Jews. The revolt would intensify in 1937. Both sides would commit acts of terror. Both sides killed civilians. The Holy Land, more like a land that is bloodied to death. Jabotinsky and the Radical Wing first designed the blueprint to deal with radical violence, not in Palestine in mind, but with Poland in mind. This is why the majority of training was done there to fight anti-Semitism. Defense through action, it would be known. However, the guidebook became a blueprint for terrorism. There will be blood for spilling Jewish blood. This tale of terror 
politics a dark turn in 1938 when Shalom Tebezik would take revenge for his fallen friend who was killed by a Palestinian combatant. He was like Abraham, an illegal immigrant who migrated not to build but to fight for his dear leader, Jabotinsky. When his friend was killed, he remembered what Jabotinsky told him. He told the youth, the proud, noble, Shalom did not take on a mission to find the man who killed his friend. He would be noble instead and go on a mission to kill innocent civilians. He would throw two hand grenades and fire shots at a bus carrying 24 Palestinian civilians. Thing is, he failed. He would become the first Jew to be executed in British Mandate Palestine. As he walked to the gallows, Jabotinsky was on his tongue as he uttered words and phrases. His last message to his family read, I can't tell you how happy I am that I have been given the chance to die in the land of Israel. I have never dreamed that I would die such a heroic death. Shalom was the ideal soldier Jabotinsky dreamed of. He was a soldier who could interpret Jabotinsky's words and took action. But he was also a fool. In a month, 90 civilians would be killed. His little fascists would attack workers in Tel Aviv. And Jabotinsky would show his support even if the targets were women. His followers were pushing him to endorse these acts as they were what he desired. Although showing some restraint to not attack the British, his admirer and monster, Menshim Began, would be more extreme and overtake Jabotinsky, saying, I train to fight in defense of my people and conquer my homeland. The war that was envisioned by Jabotinsky and the Beitar leaders was being fought. A war for the Holy Land where the youth would wake up and kill civilians, combatants, and anyone to purify the land. Thus, pushed by Began, Jabotinsky would endorse terrorism. This was his address to Shalom's terrorist attack. Today, the summer of 5,699, there is no need to renew the childish argument over the moral values of Halvaga and retaliation. Every Jew in the land of Israel and dysphoria who will wholeheartedly be pleased with every act of, of retaliation. And anyone who says that they are not pleased is a liar. Don't you dare punish the innocent. Such a superficial and hypocritical prattle in war. In each war, in every single war, are not both sides innocent? What crime did the enemy soldier setting out to be my opponent commit? This is pauper. Like me, a slave. Like me, conscripted by force. If a war breaks out in Europe, we will unanimously demand a sea and a land embargo on the enemy to starve out their children with their innocent women and children. And after the first aerial attack on London and Paris, we will expect an aerial attack on Stettenberg and Milan, in which there are many women and children. There is no war other than war against innocence. Every war is, dam is damned. There is no form. Defense and attack together, and if you don't want to harm the innocent, die. <laughs> and if you don't want to die, shoot and don't chatter. 
It is because of this elementary lesson taught to us by Ben Yusuf that I call him my teacher. But was that his true colors? Heller would say that his statement was riddled with ambiguity. He used that tactic as a spear, pushing more and more further right, unleashing the monsters. Jabotinsky would be a true snake, one with blood-soaked hands, as how many innocents have died because of his ambiguous words and flirtation with fascism. There's a speech from Kingdom of Heaven where Orlando Bloom, for the first time in his acting career, puts his full effort. In it, Balian asks who truly has claim over Jerusalem, as the Christians built their holy sites over the Jewish and the Muslims built their holy sites over the Christian. Balian claimly states that none have claim, but also that all have claim. In saying that, Balian prioritizes the life of the innocent in his defense of the city from Salah ad As a Christian, takeover was one that was bloody as innocent Muslim women and children were slaughtered. Billion would lose the battle and surrender Jerusalem to Salah al-Din, meeting him up for terms. It is a scene that I think about a lot. Billion came to discussion with terror as he thought Salah al-Din would take revenge and slaughter everyone. When Billion tells Allah of that history, the great leader simply says, He is not those men. That he would give safe passage to every Christian, even the king. Terms were made. Billion, with his speech in mind, where he deconstructed the claim of Jerusalem, turns to Salah al-Din as he walks away and asks, what is Jerusalem worth? Salah al-Din turns slight and tells Balian that Jerusalem is worth nothing. He then walks a bit further and turns around with a smile on his face, clenching his fists, saying, everything. This harkens back to Balian's initial question of what is Jerusalem? Which is more holy? Who has claim? The religious construct of the Holy Land has led to a never-ending war. Jerusalem's holy sites are bricks, but the religious background, the construct has drawn combatants from all over the globe on a perpetual crusade. At some point, the crusade becomes a cover-up to commit acts of violence, as violence begets violence. Religion would be used to fuel the fires of fascism and mask itself with defense. The reason why Israel to this day is still killing Palestinians is because the Arab threat that was fabricated by Jabotinsky has been passed down through the years. One side has rockets and jets, the other side has bricks and stones. There is no threat. Yet, never-ending wars is what feeds fascism. The made-up enemy to place their violence and oppression has to exist. However, it is masked and the tactic of dodging and ambiguity is still used to this day. Jabotinsky, the founder of revisionist Zionism, haunts the Palestinians to this day. 
The notions and the core ideas exist in Palestine's current politics. And the dream of restoring the great Jewish empire is still being chased. It's funny how the state that flirts with fascism the most is one that is Jewish. There's a sick irony to that. I was happy when I read of Jabotinsky's death in 1940, but I felt anger take over me once I learned he is not seen as one who flirted with fascism, but as a hero of democracy. He was a snake who used ambiguity to hide his true motives. Whether he was a fascist or not, he justified fascism and justified acts of terror. Does there exist out there a future where labor won the political battle and the Palestinians and Jews are living side by side in peace? To me, that's just another lost future. Jabotinsky, Jabotinsky, how oh, I wonder if you're happy. So many have died because of your words And now they're in the grave just as you are Jabotinsky, oh dear Jabotinsky Did you know that so many would die because of your words? I hope you're happy, I hope you're rolling in your grave And your ghost is haunting Watching the Palestinians die. Dear Jabotinsky, I hope you never return. <laughs> There's one person that I would never bring back from the death. It would be you. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching my awesome video that I worked super hard on. Uh, it's been a wild ride looking into Zionism and the revisionist movement and it was quite exhausting um, you know I wanted to talk about a lot of things and look into modern day uh, Israel but you know um, that's for another time this video is already as big as it is so hope you enjoyed the video I hope you like uh, subscribe comment I don't know what people do um, <laughs> yeah I don't know um, this is kind of the end of the video so you know you should probably go away and do something with your life. Um, don't be like Jabotinsky. Don't incite violence like Trump. Um, yeah, don't kill people. That's not good. Don't endorse violence and killing innocent civilians. I think that's the main takeaway of this video. Um, you know, I really wanted to focus on Jabotinsky, but also the youth movement and why they joined in with his awesome, you know, crusade. Um, later on. I'll come back to Israel and I'll make a video about modern times and what I think about their human rights uh, violations. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, had some fun <laughs> making this video as you probably will hear me laugh throughout it. Uh, there are a lot of laughs where I cut and couldn't maintain. Um, yeah, yeah, it was fun writing this. <laughs> but also, uh, I think part of it was that, you know, I was outraged that I never knew such a history existed and that this was the foundation of what Israel is today. And I gotta say, Jabotinsky, you gotta, you made a huge monster. And if you're, if you're watching this right now, you know, your ghost may be watching this. I don't know. If you are, then you lived a pretty bad life. And I just want you to know that, you know, I just want you and other people who admire you to know that you lived a pretty bad life and you're a pretty bad person so you know you've had a few years like 60 50 no uh he died in the 40s 80 years to reflect about your life you know i really hope you you came to a conclusion that you were you could have been a better person by the end of it um you know i understand that your revisionist movement did fight against the nazis and kill a few of their men, which is good, you know, that's good that you fought against the Nazis. But um, after that, you kind of adopted the Nazi tactic of purging the Arabs in Palestine and 
colonizing that land with military might. <sighs> Which is not good, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah, where's the kindness and the sympathy and the empathy of other people, you know? Anyways, thanks for watching. I'm Lost Futures, and I'm going to go out and be lost some more. The weather's amazing right now. Perfect time to just wander into the forest and be like, hey, Sasquatch, what's up?